what would it cost to buy your soul? In The Devil Wears Prada, the protagonist, Andy Sachs, gets the kind of opportunity people dream of. A million girls would kill for this job. But in order to benefit from it, she needs to give up part of herself. In this spin on the Faustian bargain, Andy's transformation from a poorly dressed, out-of-work journalist to a jet-setting, high-fashion working girl is more cautionary than aspirational, and this separates Andy from many other girl boss protagonists. Andy's bargain is with the devil of the fashion world herself, formidable runway editor-in-chief Miranda Priestly. In exchange for becoming Andrea, Andy is given gifts of excess and delight. And shirts and jackets and belts. Granted entry into exclusive and faraway places with influential people, and guaranteed a seemingly unlimited selection of opportunities in her field of choice, all in less than a year. The catch is it will cost her, well, everything. Let me know when your whole life goes up in smoke her family, friends, integrity, and even herself. Eventually, Andy rejects the girl boss fantasy and the earthly pleasures of her deal with the devil, choosing a path more true to her core values. So what is it about Miranda Priestly's girl boss, lean-in style path to success that is so tempting to our onion-breathed heroine? Did someone eat an onion bagel? And how did Andy's final decision prefigure today's scorn for the false promise of the whole girl boss myth? Here's our take on what Andy's character arc says about selling your soul and how to get it back. Face it, Andy, you sold your soul the day you put on that first pair of Jimmy Choo's. Dr. Faustus is the main character in a classic German folk legend, famously dramatized by Goethe and Christopher Marlowe. The protagonist is a smart man who, frustrated by the limitations of human knowledge, strikes a deal with Lucifer. Faustus will get 24 years of unlimited magical power and, once the party is over, the devil will collect his soul. The story's core idea has been revisited and reinterpreted throughout the centuries. What I want from you is your voice. Take Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, where a man doesn't age for 18 years in exchange for his soul, or the legends that famous musicians like Robert Johnson and Bob Dylan sold their souls to the devil to achieve their success. And the devil was walking side by side. And when you mix that story with the tale of the plucky office girl like Peggy Olson, Tess McGill, or Mary Richards, you get The Devil Wears Prada. Unlike the traditional Faustian tale, The Devil Wears Prada is centered around female ambition. Andy is a young woman working for a fashion magazine, and her closest colleagues are two other women who become the most important relationships in her life. The person whose calls you always take, that's the relationship you're in. Andy makes her Faustian bargain early in the film, when she decides to conform to the fashion-forward aesthetics of runway. Are you wearing the, Ch the Chanel boots? Yeah, I am. While Andy initially thinks caring about fashion is dumb, she makes this change as a calculated trade. She compromises her identity and values so she can have the material and career success she's after. I just have to stick it out for a year. One year and then I can do what I came to New York to do." The film leans into the Faustian nature of this deal. Nigel's razor tongue, Emily's flaming red hair, and Miranda's sadism all make Andy's workplace a hellscape. Miranda in particular strikes fear in the hearts of everyone. I don't understand why it's so difficult to confirm an appointment. No, I'm so sorry, Miranda. Like many other Faustian characters, Andy becomes unrecognizable to the people who knew her before her deal with the runway devil. For the last 16 years, I've known everything about that Andy, but this person I don't get her. But it pays off. After choosing to give up her own identity, Andy is accepted into the influential high fashion world of the magazine. You look good. From that moment on, Miranda calls her by her name. Andrea, I would like you to deliver the book to my home tonight. And she's invited into Miranda's inner circle. Andy gets exactly what she wanted. But once you make a deal with the devil, you're at risk of becoming one yourself. The Devil Wears Prada came out eight years before the term girl boss was coined, and 10 years before its disgraced coiner, nasty gal founder Sofia Amoruso, declared bankruptcy. But the movie anticipates the rise and fall of girl boss ideology as we follow Andy's dealings with the devil. Don't be ridiculous, Andrea. Everybody wants this. Everybody wants to be us. Miranda Priestly is the archetypal girl boss. She's a powerful businesswoman whose whole identity is rooted in her work. She hustles and fights to stay at the top, facing off against powerful men who do not value her. They're replacing Miranda? Yeah, and she's bringing me in to run all the editorial content. And much like the girl boss CEOs of the 2010s, she frames her work as providing a necessary service to meet the needs of her overlooked feminine clientele. And what they did, what they created, was greater than art, because you live your life in it. 
Over the course of the movie, Andy becomes more and more enchanted by Miranda's power and talent, and she becomes more and more like her role model. They share a single-minded ambition and a commitment to their career over everything else. Andy begins to dress like Miranda in moments that are pivotal to her climb. They both even have last names that invoke power and prestige, Sachs like the bank and Priestley like the minister of a church. I see a great deal of myself in you. But as glamorous and magnetic as Mrs. Priestley is, the movie's representation of Miranda also exposes the more devilish aspects of being a girl boss. Her power emboldens her to be abusive, sadistic, and needlessly cruel. The tales of your incompetence do not interest me. She creates a toxic and demanding work environment. Andy is on call 24-7, the pay is terrible, and the cutthroat culture means her co-workers don't exactly balance the scales. This echoes many real-life complaints about iconic 2010s girl bosses. CEOs who ran companies that promoted themselves as shining beacons of feminist empowerment only to be subjected to lawsuits accusing gender-based discrimination, sexual harassment, and toxic work environments. The Devil Wears Prada gets what girl bosses a decade later seem to forget, that the patriarchal structure of capitalism creates an oppressive system, even when it's being led by fabulous women. Truth is, there is no one that can do what I do. As Andy gets closer and closer to Miranda, she becomes similarly manipulative. She makes choices to put herself first and doesn't prioritize the people in her personal life. And when asked to defend those choices, Andy feigns powerlessness. I kept trying to leave, but there was a lot going on. She uses her mantra of, I didn't have a choice, to absolve herself of responsibility. She chooses to give up part of her identity to fit in at runway, and she chooses to stay in a job she could easily quit. As the movie progresses, people start holding her accountable for her manipulation. I'm like, I didn't have a choice. Oh, you know how she is. Please, that is a pathetic excuse. Miranda even acknowledges that Andy revealed her true colors in accepting the trip to Paris, essentially stealing that opportunity from Emily. I couldn't do what you did to Nigel, Miranda. I couldn't do something like that. You already did. Andy's deal with the devil put her on a path towards the abusive capitalism she despised at the start of the film. She is not happy unless everyone around her is panic, nauseous, or suicidal. But fortunately for Andy, the biggest difference between her and Miranda is that she makes the choice to leave behind her girl boss ambition. As Andy becomes increasingly wrapped up in the power and prestige of Runway, she starts to make excuses for Miranda. Just like the adherence to Girl Boss at the height of its movement, Andy excuses toxic behavior under the guise of feminism. Okay, she's tough, but if Miranda were a man, no one would notice anything about her except how great she is at her job. But Andy's too smart and too close to Miranda to delude herself forever. She sits right next to Nigel when Miranda gives away his new job to save her own, and she sees how it hurts him. She sees the full extent of the price she'll have to pay to be a true girl boss, and she asks herself an important question. But what if this isn't what I want? And so Andy chooses to walk away from the power and influence she was previously willing to compromise herself for. She fundamentally rejects the idea that we should kill ourselves for work and realizes the allure of girl boss culture is fake. I wanted to say that you were right about everything. That I turn my back on my friends and my family. Putting women at the top of unequal and abusive corporate structures built by men isn't how we end deeper structural problems. Just like Dr. Faustus, Andy sees that parties, fancy clothes, and material success will not bring salvation. These things don't bring Miranda salvation either. Her life outside of work is just as dysfunctional as her corporate culture. Dragon lady, career obsessed. Snow queen drives away another Mr. Priestley. The lesson Andy learns is that our jobs will not save us, because they aren't supposed to. And just as the Devil Wears Prada predicted, the girl boss didn't save us either. Thankfully, in the end, Andy sees through the tempting veneer of the girl boss before she's past the point of redemption, and our girl saves herself. Must have done something right. Thanks for watching The Take. Make sure to subscribe and let us know what you want The Take on next.